A suspect garment, preferred by licentious Mediterranean types, revealing everything about a girl except her mother's maiden name. Modern Girl magazine said it's hardly necessary to waste words on the so-called bikini because no girl with tact or decency would ever wear one. I'm TK, your guide to the past as we uncover the people, events, and little-known facts hidden in the shadows of your old history textbooks. From empress baddies to activist profiles, turkey gods and the history of the toothbrush, tattoos, Pompeii peepees, and everything in between, you can find it all here. There's no telling how far we'll dig or how many historical facts we'll re-examine. No event is too small and no topic is too big because this is for the love of history. Hello, 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 my friend. You are listening to For the Love of History. Do you like that new little intro? It's pretty cool, huh? It's cool, no? It's very cool. Well, Welcome back to uh, my old friends and welcome to my new friends. We have come together on this fine episode, episode 32, to talk about the very scandalous history of the swimsuit. I know it's January and a lot of people in the world uh, are, are not thinking about swimsuits because things are covered in snow and it's very cold. But... Trust me, when I say the history of the swimsuit is spicy enough to warm you wherever you are. So, grab your towel and your favorite pool floaty and let's get to it. Our trip to the past today starts in the 1800s. Now, let me paint you a picture of what's going on in the 1800s. The White House is unfinished, Canada is still a British colony, electricity is just a little experiment, and sliced bread wouldn't be invented for about another 130 years. But there was this newfangled thing called the railroad. They were going up. They were doing it. Railroads were being built. It was great. People were moving about and they needed something fun to do once they got to their destination. So they went to the beach, as one does. Sunbathing and swimming became a huge source of fun and recreation for people in the U.S. and the U.K., as well as other parts of Europe. Before the 1800s, people mostly swam and bathed in rivers or lakes in the nude. (laughs) But that was completely unacceptable in the West during the Victorian age. The U.S. and many parts of Europe were, you know, in the midst of Victorian morality and modesty. We could never be nude, no, no. And thus, the first fir- first bathing suits were created. But the 19th century swimsuit doesn't even look like a distant cousin of the modern swimsuit. Honestly, if you held up, like, a regular gown and a swimming gown, as they're called... I would be hard-pressed to tell you the difference. They had puffy sleeves, long billowy bloomers under their even longer dresses, and tights under all of that. Swimming gowns were designed to hide the figure, to be opaque even when wet, and be heavy enough so that they wouldn't float up, revealing the delicate bits. From head to toe, affluent ladies were laced up, buttoned up, and sewn in. From the high lacy collars to the long lace-up bathing slippers, yes, bathing slippers, and the cherry on top was a big old hat. Some women would even sew weights into their gowns to keep them from floating up as like an extra modesty guard barrier safety. I don't know. I'm just picturing like these affluent ladies having their maids sew in weights like yes the missus will be going swimming on saturday <laughs> like it seems like a murder plot like if you put too much weight in one of the dresses you could definitely murder somebody like i'm serious these suckers weighed 10 pounds or more before they were even wet because they were made of thick ass wool when they got wet they could weigh up to 20 freaking pounds It sounds crazy dangerous to me. 
I couldn't find any reports of women dying from drowning because of these dresses, but I'm going to keep looking and I'll report back on the Instagram, so stay tuned for that. And by the way, I will be posting pictures of all of these swimming gowns and other swimsuits that we talk about today. So all of that swimming dress, the booties, the bloomers, the, the, the dresses on top, you think that would be enough to make anyone feel like they were modest, but no, no, no. If you were a proper lady, you would have something called a bathing machine. And that was a six foot by six foot or two meter by two meter for the uh, non-American listeners. <laughs> so basically it was a house. It was a house on wheels that would be pulled by horses or people into the shallows of the ocean. When the fancy pants rich ladies would exit her machine, she would be able to bathe in privacy of her own personal little house thingy. Some even had holes in the bottom and open roofs for extra privacy. Like, you didn't even have to leave the little house. You could just swim in your six foot by six foot little house area and no one would ever see you. However, don't get it twisted. This was not the reality for most people when it came to swimming. This was the rich and the white. Slavery was still going on until the late 1800s, and there was a huge population of extremely low-income people. And they would simply swim at different beaches, and they would do it in their undershirts and under dresses, like light linens and stuff, which sounds so much better. So how did we get from big, huge wool swimming gowns to the itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini well to answer that question my friend we must get into our time machines and travel to the year 1912 Welcome to the year 1912, my friend. The Summer Olympics are going down and women are finally allowed to participate in the event of swimming. Swimming was added in 1896, but not made available to anyone other than white dudes for years. With women being allowed to swim for sport, there was a need for swimsuits that didn't weigh 20 pounds or like 10 kilograms when wet. The dress style of the swimsuit was ditched in 1912 when Annette Kellerman introduced a very, very scandalous swimsuit called the Kellerman suit. Picture basically a wetsuit, like full shorts, like a t-shirt on top. That's what it was. That was her very scandalous swimsuit. That's what it looked like. That shouldn't cause much of a fuss, should it? Oh, it did. It really did. We will find out in this episode that new swimsuit styles are not readily accepted. It's not good. When Kellerman donned her swimsuit in the 1912 Olympics, she was arrested for public indecency. And that would not be the first time, nor the last time, a woman or a man would be arrested for their swimsuit. In the early 1900s, there were actual swimsuit police They were an actual thing, and they would patrol the beaches. They were real-life police officers that would go around checking to see if your bathing suit was up to moral standards. They had, like, officially issued measuring sticks and badges. What the heck? As a woman, if your shorts were too short, bam, fine or jail if you were a man and you had the audacity to have your nipples out bam you and your little nipples are going to jail or you're paying a hefty fine i'll put some pictures up on instagram of these actual beach police and you can see them measuring women's swimsuits shit was serious police were not messing around when it came to casual swimwear I'll also post a picture of a police officer forcibly carrying a woman off of the beach in Chicago for having an indecent, air quotes, indecent bathing suit. It's ridiculous. But thankfully, this era would not last forever. As the world entered into the roaring 20s, dresses got shorter and tighter, and so did swimsuits. This is actually a common occurrence in uh, the swimsuit world. 
when evening dress styles change, so do swimsuit styles. So the swimsuit police were no longer a thing, and the swimsuits kept getting smaller and smaller. The two-piece would finally hit the scene in the 1930s, but the more popular Malliot style would outshine it. The Malliot style is like a halter top, one-piece swimsuit. Like, picture the white swimsuit that Marilyn Monroe wore, like her famous bathing suit pictures. Love them, by the way. That is the um, the Malliot swimsuit style. It will also be posted on Instagram. <laughs> So the Malliot style would take over the swimsuit scene for years until one of the biggest events in the world happened, World War II. World War II was an era of rations. The U.S. cut production of essentially every manufactured good in support of the war, and you could only buy certain amounts of essential things. Swimsuits were no exception. Through the entire war, materials used to make swimsuits were cut by 10%. So, the cut of swimsuits also changed. <laughs> oh, that's a bad joke. I'm gonna just stick to uh, history and not do stand-up anyways. So swimsuits had to be cut somewhere. Something had to give. And the only place for swimsuits to give a little bit was in the midriff. They were already super short. They already just had straps. So the tum-tum area had to go. Through the war, swimsuits would continue to shrink and it would come to its full scandalous fruition in the summer after the war. I titled this section of the podcast add a little spice. And if you're uh, also addicted to TikTok, you'll get the reference. But if you're not, congratulations on your productive life. I don't know that life, <laughs> but I digress. By the time the war ended, high-waist two-piece bathing suits were the most common cut. Beaches far and wide had ladies clad in rayon fabric, stretchable cotton, and latex nylon. Tops of bellies galore all over the beaches, but not a belly button to be found. In 1946, one man thought it was high time to release the long-imprisoned navel, and that brave man's name was Louis Riard, a French designer from France. Louis worked in his mother's lingerie store and had experience making delicates, and one day he was like, I'm gonna make a swimsuit using the lingerie pattern. I'm a genius. And that's precisely what he did. And by doing so, he made the world's first bikini. I hear you saying, but TK, why did he name it the bikini? Once again, friend, you amaze me with your line of questioning, you inquisitive little cat. Lewis knew that this new swimsuit design would make an explosive entrance onto the fashion scene and cause a sort of chaos. So he wanted a name to reflect that. The U.S. had just begun testing nuclear bombs on the Bikini Atoll Islands, and that seemed to be explosive enough for Lewis, and thus the bikini was born. Side note about nuclear testing. Uh, it consisted of detonation of 23 nuclear weapons by the United States between 1946 and 1958. It's just a little side nugget for you. It's really interesting. I did not know that before researching this episode. I digress. Lewis was right to believe that the bikini would cause a ruckus. After creating the bikini, he wanted to model it and show it off to the world, but no models would work for him wearing the bikini. They did not want that scandal ruining their profile. Profile? <laughs> Portfolio, I mean. So Lewis hired a showgirl by the name of Micheline Bernardi, and she looks great. Oh my god, friend. You know, the picture will be up, but let me describe her to you. She's standing by a little gate, poolside. She got a big old gorgeous smile on her face. Legs for approximately days. I want to eat them. I'm so jealous. Hair ever so delicately quaffed, and she's wearing the high-waisted string bikini with a very interesting modern pattern on it. But people did not care 
what she looked like. They were in an uproar. The quotes I read to you at the intro were all from the time the bikini was released. People did not like it. Some Catholic countries like Italy even banned the bikini altogether. And don't you dare step on a public beach in the States with one on. Oh no. It was also banned from the Miss World contest for several years. We almost went back to the beach swimsuit police era. We got real close. It was a little dangerous. And people would hold on to this hate for years until the 1950s when the beach scene was hopping and teenagers of the West were rebelling hard. So anything to make their parents mad was a good thing. And by the 1960s, the bikini was super common. And from 1970 through the 1990s, the swimsuit took on a new life. Whole industries were created around women's swimwear. Not just manufacturers and designers, but magazines, TV shows, new kinds of modeling. Charlie's Angels, Farrah Fawcett, Baywatch, Pamela Anderson. And if you're an elder millennial like me or older, these names are probably super familiar to you. I know I have vivid memories of a poster of Farrah Fawcett with big old fluffy hair and a tiny red one piece in my childhood garage. I moved five times in my childhood, and every time there was a Farrah faucet in my garage by my dad's tool case. And I know my brother remembers this too, because we spent hours trying to figure out who the hell this lady was, because she looked a little bit like my mom, but with different hair and not my mom. <laughs> so as a child, we we're like, who is this woman? Anyways. I know my mom and my brother and my dad all listen to this episode, so do you guys remember the Fair Fawcett poster? Anybody? Well, if they don't, I am 100% positive that somebody out there does, because this one poster sold over 12 million copies. Her swimsuit is even in the freaking Smithsonian, for lord's sake. <laughs> what? It's crazy. I really need to know where it's at in the Smithsonian because I've been there and I didn't see it. Maybe it's a new installment. I'm not sure. But anyways, the swimsuit has permeated pop culture worldwide. One iteration of Barbie even wore Pamela Anderson's famous red swimsuit. I'm sure that if you are an elder millennial or older like me, if you see a red bathing suit, you know Baywatch, of course. And if I said, she wore a, you could finish the rest of that song. The global swimwear market was valued at 18.85 billion US dollars this year. And this market value is forecast to reach 29.1 billion US dollars by 2025. The swimsuit has come so far since the 1800s, and I am so glad that no one is getting arrested anymore for wearing an itsy bitsy, teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. We have come to our final thought today, friend. Uh, I've given a pretty rosy history of the swimsuit. I mean, other than the numerous arrests and scandals. But the swimsuit has also been the source of a lot of heartache and a vessel for unrealistic body expectations. The modeling industry has been very cruel and exclusive when it comes to models and swimsuit cuts. For a long time, if you didn't fit a particular mold, then you were seemingly unworthy of wearing a swimsuit in the first place, or at least that's what I felt like, and I'm sure a lot of people out there have felt like as well. But thankfully, companies and independent influencers are changing that narrative. More inclusive sizing is being offered, more styles are being created to suit every kind of body, and companies are starting to get their shit together and diversify their model lineup. There is still a ways to go, but it's getting there. And if you remember only one thing from this episode today, please, please let it be this. Wear the damn swimsuit. You look 
stunning, and fuck anybody who says otherwise. Well, my lovely sweet friend, that is all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed episode 32, and if you did, please leave a review, drop some stars if you got time, or send me a message on Instagram. I love, 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 love hearing from you. Just a quick reminder, all the pictures from today's episode will be on Instagram for the love of underscore history podcast. You can also find a link tree in my bio to other listening platforms and the podcast Patreon if you feel so inclined to donate. One last announcement. We are approaching the one year anniversary of For the Love of History and so there will be a new logo going up and I'm also making stickers. Ooh, exciting. So look out for that in the near future. Thank you very much for joining me today. And if you know someone who you think would love this podcast, send it to them or force them to listen. I find that to be very effective. (laughs) That's all I have for you. I'll see you on February 19th when we talk about Maori tattoos from the underworld. Okay, bye. Why is there a metronome right now? Oh, okay. <laughs>